Which one? Senator Von Imhoff. Thank you. Um, so through the chair to kind of build on Senator Machiki's, so Ms. Rodell, the two questions that I have, and they're somewhat related, um, I'd like to kind of bring up, because I attended this Bridgewater presentation. I was there for the entire thing and, and heard the conversations and heard the questions. So when I asked initially a few slides ago about separating out the earnings reserve account, there was some discussion at this original meeting about how that affects um, the stress test. So the two questions that I have, and they're related, is to what degree does separating the earnings reserve account from the corpus um, affect the stress test? And then secondly, kind of more in a philosophical, other foundations across the United States and the world manage to pull 5% a year in perpetuity uh, and yet manage to stay an ongoing concern. So uh, this is done for the last decades successfully. Couple that with no other fund in the United States or the world separates out an earnings reserve account with the corpus. That is a key difference. And so I'd like to hear Ms. Rodell's comments on that. Uh, Madam Chair, if I can, I'd like to go to the next slide because I think it's really important to note that what slide 29 is telling you is not that it can't be done. I think what it's trying to show you is the stress scenarios. Under what conditions does it make it difficult or what does this look like under a variety of scenarios? When I go to slide 30, Bridgewater has developed a database over 100 years of securities activity. And they've used and they've developed models to create proxies for assets classes that didn't exist 100 years ago. So they have a robust data base to which to draw on to do these. They, each of the gray lines on this chart represents a different 10-year period applied to the target asset allocation of the fund that the Board of Trustees has passed. This assumes that the Board of Trustees makes no changes as a result of what's happening in the market. It assumes that the trustees make no changes based on what requirements come to them in terms of use of the fund. This is just, if all things being equal, if we continue to manage just like we're currently required to, what could happen if we are required to make this draw? What you will see is that taking, and this is just one example, of a 10-year time period. So the blue line highlighting out of all of these grays, and you'll see most of the lines fall well above this. What this line is highlighting is what has happened to the markets from 2007 to 2016. And if we apply that market activity to the current target asset allocation, it would generate the following results, which as you can see means that in 2019, the losses of 30% would wipe out the earnings reserve account, which means that there's nothing available to draw because you're not allowed to draw out of the corpus of the account. The fund continues to stay invested. It makes 27.9%, but it hasn't recouped an amount available for a contribution out of the earnings reserve account. And then starting in 2021, those contributions continue to be made going forward for through 2027. So all this is designed to do is to gain parameters and understanding. It's not saying you can do it, you can't do it. It's, a, it's not saying any of that. It's to give information as to what could potentially happen in the event that we have a significant down market, that earnings reserve account has a zero balance, and it's possible. Ms. Rodell, thank you for those comments. Uh, I appreciate them greatly. Uh, for me, if we could go back to slide 29, I do have uh, some interest in some of the assumptions uh, to provide uh, this particular analysis. And then for those listening at home, I'm looking at page uh, 20 in the presentation that does talk about the previous three years, the previous five years, and then the since inception returns that are much higher than that scenario is playing out in its lower cases um, as a 3% return or a 4.5 or even a 6.3, which is 
the green line on the top. The last three years, we haven't achieved uh, 6.3. We achieved 6.1. The last five years, we've achieved an 8.85. And then for since inceptions, an 8.79. So we've beaten those market projections uh, consistently. But what I'd like to know about um, this formula is a couple things. Uh, first, um, in the scenario that was run, does it base the permanent dividend draw in current state statute? Is that included as far as the underlying model calculations for money being removed uh, from the fund from the interest? Uh, it does not speak to how much is for dividend or other purposes. So it's just saying you pull five and a quarter percent, stepping down to five percent. What happens to that draw amount is not anywhere in this analysis. And to your earlier point, just to be clear, what this analysis say, is saying is that if you only earned 4.5% per year for the next 10 years, you are going to exhaust the earnings reserve account. If you make more than 4.5%, you will be in that triangle space between the 4.5% line and the 6.3% line. And if you earn 6.3% 3, 6 or better each of those years, you will use any of the earnings reserve account. And then they assign probabilities to the odds of falling short. So the odds of having a year where you have less than 6.3% is 1 in 2, 50%, 50, 48% to be precise. The odds of having one year of having less than a 3.3% or lower is 20%. That's what, this is, that's what this slide is saying. You've stated that well several times now, Ms. Rodell. Thank you. And again, slide 20 reflects um, the history. My second point is um, in understanding the calculation is inflation proofing and uh, whether that is included uh, as part of the underlying structure that we can't see on the risk analysis. So have you calculated uh, moving from the earnings reserve to the corpus of the fund uh, inflation proofing? Uh, yes, this embeds in that annual return. It's embedding a 2.25 percent inflation amount calculated on what the corpus is moving into that corpus. And it's making that draw second to the contribution of the five and a quarter or five percent. Do you have that number in totality as far as billions that is used in the underlying? On slide 30, you will see at the end in 2027, there would be cumulative distributions. So it's about two-thirds of the way down, cumulative distributions to the state of 22, in this stress test, assuming that these market things would happen, of $22.6 billion. And cumulative, you would miss inflation-proofing payments to the tune of a negative $2.6 billion because it's the second priority you would have a real value of the principal at that point of about $41 billion. Ms. Rodell, my last question, and I know I have members that are um, waiting. The amount of time that it took to reach a $10 billion uh, total value was significant. And then to move from 10 to $30 billion was an extremely, um, it, it seemed like a long period of time uh, as a, person who uh, waited with a small family to receive their uh, annual dividend check. So it, it was important to my family uh, for, for that dividend in the October time period to show up. Can you talk about the doubling of the fund? Because um, I, I, I'm still remembering now, actually, since I've been elected, I believe, a value in the $34 billion range. And we're almost doubling that value now. So. Um, I know uh, when I was very young, uh, people talk, when people talked to me about interest, we talked about doubling your money over a period of time. W what, what is anticipated right now under the current assumptions that the board of directors have uh, placed on asset allocation in that doubling process? Um, 
Madam sure Chair, it's been, it's been interesting because if we look to what happened in the financial crisis and we look at the fund values in 2008, 2009 timeframe, you'll see that total assets under management were about $29 billion. And so even within just the last 10 years, we are sitting at uh, today approximately $65 billion of assets under management. I, um, obviously the markets have done really well over the since that in terms of recovery. But there have been years where it's been flat. I mean, we can look to 2015 as early as, tw recently as 2015 as a, as a fairly flat return year. Um, but I think probably the biggest contributor to what the fund growth has, um, ha has come from has been removing the allowed list of investments that happened in 2005, 2006 timeframe and giving the trustees the full uh, plate of investments to choose from and using that prudent investor rule as its guideline. And so the board of trustees has taken that and put together a very well-rounded, diversified asset allocation and allowed us to get into things like private equity, which has contributed 18% over the last five years alone in terms of return and fund value. So uh, I think that has probably been the biggest contributor and will continue to be the biggest contributor going forward in, in terms of adding value to the fund. I'll hold my next question. Senator Von Imhoff followed by Senator Bishop, followed by Senator Hoffman. Thank you. Um, you know, I can actually wait to listen to my fellow senators and then I'll, I'll follow up. Senator Bishop. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> this uh, stress test, um, and Senator Machicki brought this out earlier and I was just reading the analyses and I didn't see it in there. Did it take into consideration what Senator Machiki said about the three-year adjustment that we had built into the bill and they did take that into account when it ran this, the stress test? Um, through the chair, no, Senator Bishop. It, it assumed just a very straightforward draw of five and a quarter stepping down to five. <clears throat> Thank you, and just a comment, and just to my colleagues and those that might be home, uh, you know, if you read the disclaimer all the way through on this chart, you know, I mean, uh, you know, it's uh, it's uh, looking in the rearview mirror, and and, and it makes uh, uh, there's just some wiggle room in there. So, I think the committee did a pretty good job of. Uh, taking care of ourselves going forward by putting that three-year look-back average in there. And so I just ask people to read the disclaimer. Senator Hoffman. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> My question is similar uh, in nature to uh, Senator Bishop's. Both versions of Senate Bill 26 um, um, treat inflation-proofing um, differently when, than what the Bridgewater report um, portrays both versions have inflation proofing transfers occurring when the balance of the ERA is more than four times a payout otherwise inflation proofing of the entire fund remains uh, in the ERA and in this the, both the House and the Senate took a lot of time and effort in uh, in its t deliberations in coming up with these uh, this method um, in both bodies, and I'm, and I know that it isn't um, the law of the land, but it's farther than anything else on how we are going to um, decide how to use the, the permanent fund for government. And I'm wondering why there wasn't an addendum or um, uh, a stress test to look at the versions that the legislature had passed and what impacts that would have on a, on a stress test because I think it would uh, it wouldn't be as uh, as bleak as uh, what we're, we're looking at in um, in the charts that that Science, we have on, 29 and on, on, on 30 where uh, the bottom line in uh, 2019 
we have a real value of the principal at $40.4 billion, and we don't surpass that uh, in 19 until we get out to 2026, when we finally pass that by um, uh, 200 to 40 point six, so there's a seven year period where we're trying to catch up because of that one year of 30% um, uh, uh, loss. Through the chair, Senator Hoffman, um, we specifically did not ask for any uh, particular bill to be modeled because of there's a lot of moving parts and that inflation, that four years is a challenging calculation because the timing is not clear between the two bills. Uh, just to give you a sense um, of the difference between the House and the, the Senate version on that inflation proofing mechanism that is in that bill, the House has a different calculation because they include a 25% allocation. Um, so it would be closer to actual inflation. The Senate version has everything above the ten, four times move over, which would be a contribution to the corpus of in excess of $5 billion this year. But both of them are closer to um, um, anything than what is being presented by the Bridgewater report. And uh, the Bridgewater report, uh, with that one assumption of uh, 2008 uh, filtering through to 2019 and having a 30% uh, uh, asset portfolio uh, loss is, uh, is substantial. Through the chair, I think it's important to note that what this analysis is doing is applying a specific time period of actual results on balances going forward. So they're assuming inflation is two and a quarter percent and that we don't, we lose money during this financial crisis time period, which then requires that the distribution to the state be made first ahead of inflation proofing. And that was because we had to create a waterfall for those distributions. But you are, you are correct that actual uh, inflation contributions as calculated under the governor's operating budget would restore almost $2 billion to the, to the corpus of the fund. Wishful thinking. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Hoffman, Senator Von Imhoff, followed by Senator Michiki. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, so these uh, slides are interesting, but I think more in an academic sense, I think we're getting sidetracked on the real conversation here. How do other foundations differently manage their assets and successfully have a 5% draw on a perpetual basis and manage to maintain as an ongoing concern? Through the chair, Senator Von Imhoff, I don't have an answer for that question. I can tell you that from looking at things like the Yale Endowment, which has always been held up as a premier endowment, to be modeled after is that the calculation of 5% is based on 5% of spending. So 5% of the spending and the spending gets adjusted down or up depending on what that draw is. It's not based on 5% of the value of the endowment. So there's a lot of different rules depending on which endowment you're talking about. And I don't have an answer for you as to what is the best way forward on this. This analysis is simply designed to give you information about what could happen if we have a really wretched set of market circumstances because we know that markets go down. We know that. History tells us that we will hit a point at which the market is going to go down. And this is just pointing out what could happen if all things being equal and we don't change the target asset allocation because one of the things that is available to the Board of Trustees is that if this happens, the Board can change the target asset allocation, move it away from volatile markets like public equities, put it into fixed income, and returns will go down accordingly. That is an option on the table that this doesn't model. So I don't have an answer to your question. 
Senator Machicki. This is, uh, this is, do you feel tense a little? This is a healthy tension, <laughs> right? <laughs> and why it's healthy is because we have two different objectives. And your objective is maximum returns. Um, as you're charged to do, and our objective is to manage our state assets um, conservatively and think about how we balance that with delivering state services, right? Mm -hmm. And what your report is saying, although uh, since inception we've earned 8.79% and your objective is 7.67, is that with no changes, so you're not talking about the fact that we have a spending limit that won't take the max draw when we hit a certain level of revenue. You're not talking about our inflation proofing mechanism. You're saying with this set of assumptions, which is very stagnant, static, at five and a quarter percent to five and three years, that there's uh, a 80% chance that we meet our goals of not exhausting overall surplus. There's a 70% chance of not exhausting our earnings reserve. And there's a 52% chance that there's no problem whatsoever. That is correct. And that doesn't take into account that we will evaluate that draw, that we have an inflation proofing mechanism, that on years when we have higher revenue, we're not going to take the draw. It's just saying with that static assumption, be careful. And I, I understand it took a while to get through. I'm not sure the public will get to that point because we're concentrated on this today. Um, but I, I, it's a healthy tension, and I'm, I'm glad you have your objectives. Um, and I, I, think it's a, I think it's the right way to look at it, that we have to be as careful as possible to ensure that we don't stress um, growth of the corpus of the Alaska Permanent Fund, that incredible asset that we have available to us. So I, I get there. I mean, there, there are many funds that rely on that draw and adjust accordingly. We may have to adjust accordingly on our side and yours. And we're not even bringing the CBR discussion into this. Yeah. The CBR discussion is something that I don't think we made the right decisions early on on how the CBR is looked at uh, for a relatively low return savings account that has cost us billions of dollars over the years. I think, I think it's time for that conversation, particularly if and when we replenish those savings about how they're managed. I, I don't think we made the right decisions. We're an infant state that I think it's a, it's a good time to evaluate a lot of those, a lot of that logic. Senator Von Imhoff. Thank you. Um, Angela, Ms. Rodell, I thank you for being here and <laughs> allowing us to interrogate you. Um, <laughs> I'm very fond of you on a personal note, so just know that I come from a place of, um, uh, I, I'm just trying to do what's right by the state. My concern of why I'm pushing is that we have $13 billion in this ERA and I want to make sure we don't go through it in the next several years. I want to protect the permanent fund, and I want to look at doing a structure draw that's controlled, predictable, and sustainable over time. That's my objective. So in 2004-ish, I think the board recommended that the earnings reserve account, they look at collapsing it into the corpus. Um, to make it one large fund. And there's a reason why they did that. Uh, and that is because over time, generally having the whole fund be able to capture the excess income over time helps the fund grow. It's like pseudo, or not pseudo, like um, super inflation proofing it. There will be years where the fund will um, returns will be negative. I've lived through them. I sit on two private foundations myself now. We've lived through it. I also attend the National Council of Foundations and have talked to various different foundations as well as attended NMS conference and talked about investments. A 5% draw with a 5%, five, 5%, not five and a quarter, but 5% with a five-year look back of um, market value is a conservative approach and works over time, especially if you're not siphoning the annual returns into a special ERA account. 
Also, you made a comment is assuming that we continue to manage the exact same way as we currently are required to do. Well, it's because you have an ERA and a corpus. If, you, if we change it in order to accommodate this 5% draw, you, like, like you said, we would probably change how we manage a little bit, potentially, and I would argue that it will be better than what it is now. Not that you're mm -hmm. not managing it well, but that you would manage four or five percent draw that successfully works in many parts of the world. Um, one last comment is that we have the mental health fund here in Alaska. It's a four and a half percent draw on an annual basis, and it's worked over time. Thank you. Other questions from committee members? Ms. Rodell, I have um, two questions. One, uh, I appreciate the conservative look uh, from uh, you, from the board chair, uh, to protect the corpus of the permanent fund, which in my view has been uh, the goal of this administration <coughs> and uh, all um, legislators, whether they're for or against a particular draw. But knowing that we've been in a bull market uh, for so long, uh, given your experience with the market, uh, like Senator Von Imhoff, uh, all of us have experienced the 2007-2008 collapse uh, of at least the American economy and the stock market. Uh, we saw great losses in permanent fund earnings for those particular downward cycle quarters, and your investors, our investors nationwide, uh, stepped up to the challenge and stopped the bleeding that we had seen in previous loss scenarios. So uh, that stages the question on how are we prepared for a bear market, and do we have an evacuation plan, a an emergency plan set up for when uh, the bear arrives versus the bull? Um, you know, the challenge uh, with that question is not knowing when or where the bear comes. We just know it's sitting out there. Uh, so the steps that we've been taking that are different than where the fund was at in that 08, 09 time frame is that we have um, put together a hedge fund strategy that is uh, non-correlated or counter-cyclical to what's happening in the market, which will, in theory, protect